Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Disgustingly Resilient Podcast and another episode of the series Assembly to Annihilation. Today's episode we're going to be looking at finally getting you past that final hurdle which is the 2k point mark. This is the standard for 40k games, it's where you're going to find most people playing and it's probably like the end of the start of your journey. So it's definitely not the end but it's going to be your first time reaching that big points limit and there's a couple of things that we need to go over in order to help you reach there and be happy with the list that you've managed to get there with. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, and now remember again, as always, same as every episode, the most important rule when you're starting the hobby is the rule of cool. Do what you enjoy. If I say something is bad, but you think it is good, and you think it looks cool, grab it anyway, because balance is always changing. You becoming new to the hobby and getting into it, it's more important that you are enjoying yourself, having fun with the hobby. So if that Plague Surgeon looks really cool and you want to use a Plague Surgeon, pick up a Plague Surgeon, even if it makes me sick to my stomach. <laughs> I'm joking, he's not that bad, but yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, things to consider. So this is kind of like what we're going to talk about today. So we need to talk about, obviously, what your overall goal for the hobby is. So we need to think about if you're just going to be looking to play casual, which again, nothing wrong with. If you enjoy playing casual in like Garage Hammer, just having enough some some games, you know, maybe you only play once every few months, maybe you play weekly, but again, in the context of just friendly casual games, then the idea and the list that you'll be building towards is going to be very different than someone who maybe is looking to get into a competitive scene for the game. That person will obviously then need to pay more attention to competitive metas, potentially what's pretty good at the moment in the game, so you know what to, to get ready for, and things like that. But again, there's no wrong goal. Everything's fine. It's just about understanding what you want. And of course, what you want can change. Maybe you are a casual. You start playing games. You're really enjoying it. You actually go, hey, you know what? I'm pretty good at this game. So then you transition. You go, oh, I wonder what the competitive scene's like. And you end up becoming a competitive player. That's how I got into competitive. And maybe it'll happen to you too. Um, but yeah, there's nothing wrong. And it's just understanding what you want out of the hobby so that you can make the right purchases and the right decisions to get to that point. So another thing we need to establish is the playstyle that you enjoy. Now, this video is not going to be like a lot of videos out there which are like, here is a 2K list, this is the list, you go play this list if you want to do well. I don't work that way and the way I teach people is to always find things that work for you. The reason this podcast works with three of us, because it's me, Def Guy, Dave and Will, um, we all have very different playstyles in how we play. Um, for example, I'm a defensive kind of player, Will's aggressive, and Dave likes to lose a lot of tanks. Um, that's great because all those are viable, but we play very differently. So even though we all play Death Guard, we all play differently. And when I've tried to use like Will's lists and stuff, I find it a lot harder and a lot less enjoyable than my own kind of style and vice versa. So it's really important that, and I've hopefully from the first few episodes, you've started building thousand point lists, building yourself up, painting, you know, having fun, enjoying yourself. And maybe now you're starting to get to the point where you start thinking, okay, I've played a few games. Um, I really like these units. I do really well with these. Mm, these units over here, they're okay. Maybe not my favorite to play with. And you start to understand yourself as a player. Maybe you're the player that likes running straight down the middle. Maybe you're the player that likes to play really cagey and safe. And instead of giving you, like I said, a 2K list, the idea is to help you understand how to find out what you are as a player and then take that and transition that into buying the things necessary to make a list that will suit your playstyle and you'll have fun with, okay? Then we want to look at solidifying that playstyle inside the list you're going to make. So if you are making a list, you've got your playstyle, that's going to influence the list. Um, we're also going to start looking at multiples of units. So when you expand to 2K... A big mistake a lot of new players make when they're trying to make an effective list anyway. Again, if you're just in it for the fun, doesn't matter. But a lot of people try to just go one of everything. And one of everything is fun, but sometimes unit redundancy and having multiples of units to cover certain roles is really important to making a good fleshed out list. So you might not want to just take one rhino of Plague Marines. Maybe you want two rhinos of Plague Marines. Some people might really like Plague Marines and go four rhinos full of Plague Marines. It's really important that we start looking at double downing on certain things because it just adds redundancy to the list. It adds a bit more, um, sort of like, you, the, your plans don't fall apart as quick is what I'm trying to say. Um, and another thing we need to consider, we move into 2K games, is the overall game plan. When you're at 2K, everyone has now has a full-sized army. It's not really going to be lacking if it's built well, the list. 
you won't be lacking in any areas. You'll have units to do the fighting, units to do scoring, units to do board control. All these kind of things can be fitted fit into an army at 2k. And it's time to start looking overall at the game itself. And that's what we can do going forward. We'll touch on it in this, but maybe that can be the next episode of uh, Assembly to Annihilation. But yeah, there's one thing we want to consider. So yeah, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get into the core concepts of building a list. So I will catch you in a second. Okie dokie. So we need to start looking now at creating your 2K list that we're going to build forward. So when we're looking at expanding to a 2K list, there are a couple of things, and this is how my approach to list building anyway, that we like to look at. Uh, and these are the core concepts that I use when I'm building a list. So we break it down into different sections. So there is a list core. This is the heart of your list. This is the non-negotiable. These are the units that I bring in this army. Um, now, when I say non-negotiable, that doesn't mean every army must take this. It means I have identified what I enjoy, what I play with. These are the units that work for me. I'm going to bring these along as the heart of my army. This can range from 500 points to 1,500 points. It just depends what it is. But this is the thing that you find works for you and you enjoy playing with. That is the heart of your army and that won't really change, especially when you're first starting. Obviously, you go ahead, you experiment more. I'm trying to get better at aggressive play, so I'm changing the core at the moment to learn. But the core of my army is still the same as it has been for the last you know, couple months now. Um, then we have tech pieces. Tech pieces, and this might be something you've not heard of before, a tech piece is something that we add to a list, maybe a unit, weapon choice, um, specific upgrades, things that are specifically put into our list for certain matchups and certain metas. So a meta, for those who don't know, is like, it's sort of like what people are playing where you play. So if you have friends that love tanks, we would say you're in a vehicle meta because there's tons of vehicles. You take that knowledge and you apply it to your list building. So if you know your friends are all tread heads and there's 50 tanks in every list, you're gonna to wanna to start bringing pieces of your army to deal with that tank spam. So that could be more las cannons, predators, things like this, um, melter guns on your marines, etc. Um, and this is important, especially if you, you know, if you wanna have a nice, uh, good time, you wanna, especially if you're competitive and you're looking at getting into competitive, looking at the meta overall, is important so for example the meta that's just been we had a lot of custodians a lot of necrons so i put changes into my list to try and almost counterplay their strengths at the moment and that'll be something you'll be finding yourself doing going forward and even in your friends group it always happens you know jim buys a new tank it's really good it's just smashed everyone and then you're like okay how do i kill jim's new tank so then you get something and smash jim's tank and then jim's like oh my god that guy killed my tank so easy i need to protect my tank better how can i do that and it kind of escalates and that's half the fun of collecting especially if you're starting this journey with friends as well and um, because you're going to be like arms racing each other a little bit and um, not to say it's paid to win it's really not but you'll just find yourselves naturally sort of trying to count a little things and certain armies and back and forth and it's half the fun because it means that your army is always adapting and you know you're getting new units to play with and try out now as we move to 2k um we need to start thinking about scoring um playing the large games of warhammer is where the game is balanced at um like as we said in the 1k point video the game can be kind of unbalanced at 2k everyone has the points to be able to play the game and part of playing the game is scoring those mission cards because points are the way you win the game you can kill your entire opponent's army if he ends the game with more points than you do you still lose even if you've killed all his models so now we need to start thinking about bringing units specifically for the purpose of scoring so we can sort of chop up our list right here into three different things you have your core you have your tech choices and then you have your scoring units and all these are really important to make a nice rounded cohesive list and another thing i want to start looking at is potentially looking at allies. Maybe you're someone that really enjoys the look of Chaos Knights or bringing in some demons. And maybe that could be something you could start looking at towards 2K. It's kind of the points level where looking at allies is pretty good. Um, don't need to. If you're like me and you like to stay as pure as possible, you definitely don't need allies. You can just, nope, it's not for me. Don't do it. But if you're someone that likes a bit of variety, maybe you really like those Chaos Knight models and you're like, oh man, I really want two of those in my army. 
you go out, you buy a bag of what, box of war dogs, you can build that up and you can totally make that work in your army. But all of this together, we're going to try and form together to create a game plan for the game going forward and your future games going from there. Okay, so let's look at when we at creating a core. So we're going to now look at creating the core of a list. And the first type of core we can get is building around units. Okay, so there's nothing better in our book to look at for building around a core unit than the Mr. Mortarian himself, our Primarch. So we're looking at Mortarian now. There's a lot of stuff on his data sheet, okay? But when we're talking about build around units, we're looking at things that are almost kind of unique to them or have a certain thing that we can build around. So on Mortarian here, one thing we want to look at is stat lines. Stat lines can be built around. Toughness 12, movement 10, so he's not that slow. T12 is really tough, that's really good. 2 plus save, 4 plus invulnerable. Okay, durability is good. And a 5 up feel no pain. That's really good. So right now, and obviously 16 wounds, <laughs> so right now we have established Mortarian is very durable. That can be a build around feature as we'll see in a second. What else does Mortarian bring? Well, he obviously brings damage, but so does everything else in the game. Does he bring incredible amounts of damage that you can build around? No. So I wouldn't say we have a build around Mortarian for his damage output, but there are units in the game that you could do this for, like Magnus, for example. Um, but what else does Mortarian have? He has two auras here. One that you select from, which is on the other page, but um, they're very good auras. And the second one, Lord of Death Guard, is his best aura, which is going to allow you to do lots of different things, as we'll see in a second. So, Mortarian's features. Mainly, it's his durability. He's very tough. And that can be used to combine with other tough units to make your opponent have a very hard time trying to kill your army. Speed, he's relatively fast for Death Guard. He moves 10 inches. That can be something we can build around. Maybe you want to make like a sort of aggressive list. Having speed is good there. Lord of the Death Guard is an aura of ignoring modifiers. This is very powerful to build around because it makes Mortarian be the centerpiece model that if you put your army around, your army's output is going to be much increased because your opponent can't use any defensive abilities. This is going to be on top of his host of plagues, which gives you one of three support auras every turn, which is also great because it means you're going to be increasing either durability by giving it all cover, rerolling wound rolls of one, so you're increasing the output, and or increasing contagion range, which is a bit more niche, but it still has utility. And on top of this, he all has decent melee. So, when we talk about building around Mortarian, we've established what Mortarian brings to the table, but how do we translate this into a list? Well, I'm just gonna scoot up to the corner for a second. Up here, Whee! there we go. Um, yeah, like this. Uh, so it looks scary, but don't be too intimidated at first. So we have Mortarian at the top here. Mortarian can be split into two main ways of looking at him, which is his auras and his durability. You, as a player now, have to ask yourself, I have played with Mortarian, or I want to play with Mortarian. What do I find the best out of Mortarian? Is it his auras, or is it his durability? Or potentially, it's both. Um, and you want to use a balance mix. Now, there are ways to capitalize on both of these separately, and a way to also play them together. Now, let's go down the durability route. We really like Mortarian for his durability. Mortarian is very hard to kill. He's not invincible. You put him in front of an army, he will die. But he draws a lot of firepower and he can soak a lot of it up, especially if you get good 4 up in vulnerables. So, then we're going to look at applying our playstyle as a player. So, for example, are you a person? So, down here, your playstyle. Are you a person that really likes tanks? then if that is true, then what Mortarian can do is Mortarian shares the durability aspect of high toughness and good saves with a lot of the vehicles in our army, such as Plague vs. Crawlers, uh, which have a 2-up save, toughness 10, and a 5-up in vulnerable, and all sorts of other engines that you can bring, you know, Land Raiders, toughness 12, just like Mortarian, 2-up save, and this could lead you down the path of actually finding out you quite like engine skew, so that's lists with basically minimal infantry and lots of tanks and basically you almost stat check your opponent to say hey can you deal with all this mega tough armor because if you can't i'm going to roll you over now maybe however you like the durability aspect of mortarian 
But like me, you're not very good with vehicles. You don't like the movement that much. You much prefer infantry, but you still like the durability approach that more tiring brings. Well, then you can look at something like a Terminator skew. Terminators all rock the 2-up save and the 4-up invulnerable, which is the profile that is shared with Mortarion, who's a 2-up 4-up. He can give them cover out in the open, same as he can do for vehicles. And this could be another way to make a super durable list built around durability, but tailored towards a playstyle of two different players here. One is a vehicle-heavy playstyle. The second one is an infantry-heavy playstyle. But they both go down this durability aspect route. Now, we'll flip to the other side. The auras, so this is all about maximizing the auras of Mortarion. So again, we're gonna think about our playstyle. Maybe you're a passive player. Passive player doesn't wanna be going out and rushing at the enemy. So what can Mortarion's aura do in that one? Well, there's an indirect build, which is like Triple Plague Burst Crawler with Mortarion. What does this mean? Well, indirect, normally if you fire over buildings, you're minus one to hit and your opponent gets cover. Um, if Mortarion is around, you can use the ignore modifiers aura to ignore the penalty to hit. So you're hitting on your normal hit roll at targets you can't see. This allows you to play super safe and super passive and hide in your plague burst crawlers while still dealing damage to your opponent. So what we've done here is we took Mortarion as a build around unit. We've looked at his auras. We decide that's what we really like. And then we've applied our passive playstyle to bring the Plague Burst Crawlers because we know it allows us to play defensive and passive while still putting out onto the opponent. However, you might be more like Will, who is aggressive, wants to get in your opponent's face and cause chaos. Well, then you want to look at something like a pressure list. So this is the act of using Mortarion as a big bullet magnet sponge and pushing him forward. Maybe he's being followed by two or three Rhinos, two or three Bloat Drones, maybe a Land Raider. And that's a lot pushing at your opponent all at once. And they have to deal with it. And they might pop one or two. And then they get the rest crash into them. But the question they're going to be having to answer is, do I shoot the hardest to kill thing, which is Mortarion? Because if they don't kill him, they've killed literally nothing. They might wound him. Or do I shoot everything else? Maybe kill, like I said, a drone and a rhino. But Mortarion is now full health barreling down at them. So this, again, we're looking at the playstyle because, again, once the Mortarion connects with these auras, because you're rushing someone down, you can give cover. So even though your tanks and your infantry are out in the open because you're running at your opponent, you're all getting cover. And when you do connect, the damage is going to be absolutely horrific because, again, Mortarion's auras are allowing you to maximize damage by ignoring all the defenses of your opponent. And it also means you can't be slowed down which is something people really want to do against pressure lists. They want to reduce your movement with like basilisks, stuff like that, half your movement, reduce two from movement. Mortarion says, nope, I ignore all of that for me and my boys. So now we've took Mortarion's aura playstyle in two different styles as well. And it all comes down to this key point in the middle, which is your playstyle. And this is why I preach understanding yourself as a player, because I could sit here and be like, yeah, yeah, the tank skew, yeah, that's the best list at the moment. It's no good if you're no good at moving tanks like me. I can't move tanks. I'm not good at it. I'm I'm like, <laughs> I'm up there with the top ranked players for Death Guard, but I can't move a tank for shit. <laughs> it's the way it is. We're just better at different things. Um, and then there's a balanced approach in the middle. This is actually where I personally stand, which is I like the durability aspect of Mortarion. I really like the auras, probably leaning more to the right side here. But my play style is to be more toolboxy which means having um, like a set of tools for me to use and it's up to me to use them correctly to get the result on the table. I also like combined arms. I don't like going pure infantry or pure tank, even though I've said I'm not very good with tanks. I still see value in bringing them. So I will probably do a weird mix of this whole list of getting something like, okay, I like toolbox, which is close to combined arms, but I want to bring in a little bit of that durable playstyle. So I'm going to bring in some of the engines from over here, but I really like the passive playstyle. That's why I am. So really, I'm looking at a combined arms indirect build with a bit of durable vehicles from an engine. So that, for me, would be how I would build around Mortarion. And it's, again, as you play and as you experience and you get more used to it, think about units like Mortarion like this, okay? And hopefully, you keep applying your playstyle to all the thought process. You'll find what works for you, what you enjoy, and that, I promise you, you will have way more success with than whatever the internet is telling you is the best list in the game for Death Guard. Finding out what works for you is far more important.
promise you. Okay, the next one we'll look at is creating a core list around a style of play. So this isn't I build around Unite Mortario now. This is building a list without these big auto-include units, but all about you as a player. So again, let's let's look at myself. Um, I know myself. I like balanced armies. I like having a nice balanced mix of infantry and vehicles. I don't I don't like all infantry. I don't really like all vehicles. I like mixed. Not just from a gameplay um, perspective, but also from a thematic perspective. I like having a mix. I think it's more fun. Now, it doesn't mean it's the right for you. You might feel different, which is fine. I have a very toolboxy playstyle, um, which means I like to have units that can do certain things, and it's up to me to use those units correctly. I don't like just putting stats in front of an opponent and being like, can you kill this? Yes or no. I like having, okay, my opponent has brought X. I have Y to deal with that. But again, Y has to stay alive to deal with that. So I need to be smart and clever about how I think about things. Um, I know myself, as I said before, I am tactically better with infantry over vehicles. Still like vehicles, but I am much better with my infantry play than with my vehicle play. Okay, and um, I know again from playing, I have a passive trade based play style, so I'm quite a defensive player. I'm happy to sit back and be passive. And trading and the act of trading is basically me sending out a crappy unit. You have to then bring something out to kill said crappy unit, and I kill the thing that came out to kill crappy unit, which is hopefully something that costs more than crappy unit. Therefore, I have gained value from trading. Almost like in chess, I give you a pawn, you take it with a bishop, I take the bishop with a knight. I've lost a pawn, you lost a bishop. Um, so that's important for me to think about when I make a list. I need units that are going to enable me to make those plays because that's how I play best. Um, I enjoy reactive plays as well. I like being able to react to my opponent. So that's going to factor into maybe me needing some movement speed so I can react or maybe some deployment tricks. Um, rather than just staying still um, and another one and this is it sounds daft but it's it's so true i this is nothing to do with gameplay i hate chaos knights i don't like them i just don't know why i just don't like i look at eldar and i hate them and i look at chaos knights and i hate them so even though it makes no tactical sense and like sometimes chaos knights are really good to bring i just don't bring them because i hate them and that's fine. I found success when everyone else was saying you have to run free brigands. I managed to go 5-0 with no brigands because I don't like them. And it turns out when you use units you actively don't like, you get this weird bias against them where you kind of get them killed. Because I noticed I was doing that. I took them once to an event and I just hated them innately. So when they failed, I was like, ah, yes, you failed. But the reality was, was I putting them in scenarios to make them fail so I could justify to myself that I hated them? Um, so if you don't like a unit, don't bring it. Straight up. Just don't do it. Okay? So now I'm going to take this information. I'm going to turn that into list building. So, for me, combined arms is probably going to be what it is. I like, I said, I have a preference towards infantry. But I like bringing some tanks. So that makes me go combined arms. With probably a slight preference towards having more infantry than vehicles. This balanced composition also is going to allow me to be toolboxy. I Again, I'm going to keep my options open. I have units that can go through walls. I have tough, durable tanks. I have a nice mix of things. And it's going to play into my playstyle as a toolbox player. Um, now, deep strike units, I always like to include in my list. Because, again, I said I like reacting to stuff and being able to react. Deep Strike is one of the best ways to be able to react to certain things in the game with that rapid ingress stratagem or just showing up where you need to. Maybe, you know, the opponents all fell back to one flank. Okay, cool, in my turn I can now teleport on top of that flank and keep pressure up, etc. So I always like to include at least one, maybe two units of Deep Strike because it allows me, who knows my playstyle, to make reactive plays. Um, Indirect and fight first bring lots of value to my, to my playstyle because again I have the passive playstyle. So indirect for me, as we said before, it's a great way to passively get value out of my opponent whilst remaining safe, which plays into my playstyle of making my opponent do something. I stay passive, and then once they try to do something, I counter punch them. Um, fight first is also great for this, so I'm going to look for units that have fights first because again allows me to be the person that's being charged and still getting to strike first rather than being the person that has to charge. Okay? And then for trading, because I said I like trading, 
I'm going to look at units like cultists, bloat drones, or maybe smaller squads of plague marines rather than the big heavy squads, because these are going to allow me to feed into that playstyle of what I do best with. And then the last point, as I said, for me, it's probably going to be put purely Death Guard with maybe some demons at most because I just don't like Chaos Knights, so I'm just not going to put them in my list. Simple as that. And with these, you can kind of see, like, just from knowing my playstyle, we've already come up with some ideas of what's good for me and what's going to work for me. And from that, basically, we have managed to pick out certain things we're looking for. Haven't actually named specific units, pound the trading bit there. I just said things that I'm looking for. So, indirect keyword, fight first keyword, oh look a plague bus crawler, oh look a foul light spawn, deep strike units, what can do that? Well, we've got death shroud, we've got blight lords, we've got typhus, that's pretty cool. Combined arms means I want a nice mix, preference to the infantry. So maybe if we go like 70% infantry, 30% tanks, sounds good to me. And they're all gonna influence and play to my strengths as a player. And this is something I want you to do as a player yourself is to keep analyzing your games thinking about what's working for you and break it down like this almost look at yourself from a third person realize what you're good at what you're not good at is just as important and it's okay to not be good at something don't worry about it we all have strengths we all have weaknesses as players it's totally fine and then build your lists going forward around that idea okay all right All right, so tech pieces. So this is the next important part. Tech pieces are what we're gonna to use to adapt and overcome problems that we're facing in our games. So what is teching? Teching is bringing specific units for specific roles in the game. Um, this helps you tweak a list to adjust to certain metas and certain opponents. This can be anywhere from completely different units to weapon loadouts, stuff like that and what it allows us to do it allows us to cover our weaknesses in our list and potentially exploit opponents weaknesses in their list now very important point we tech we don't tailor tailoring is literally asking or knowing what your opponent's bringing and bringing a complete counter list there is no point in this it is rude to your opponent it is unfair and also you basically before the games even started you have put 90% of the chips in your corner and you aren't going to learn much from that game because you're just going to win it from the start. Instead, we tech little pieces. So we just change a couple things here or there to give us slight strengths against it without being a full tail list. So if you know you're playing a friends group with, you know, a Dark Eldar player, a Tau player, a Nort player, and then you found out this week you're playing against, you know, you arranged a game with an Orc player, Try your best not to just bring everything that shafts an orc because you're not going to learn anything. He's going to have a miserable time. Instead, maybe just change a couple weapon loadouts, maybe bring some new units that might be better against it. But again, we said the core of the list. Try and kind of keep that the same because if you go to play at clubs or maybe you get into the tournament scene or whatnot, you won't always know what you're playing against. Like at our club, you can arrange a game, but also when you come down for a pickup game, you would put into the random pool and you could go against any army. So if you've built a list only to play against Jim's Orcs and then you come to Club Night and your first game is against Imperial Knights, good luck, have fun, you're going to get stomped. And it's your own fault because you tailored for Orcs and got Knights. So again, we tech, we try not to tailor. We don't want to be tailoring, but teching is fine, okay? So... Here's an example that we're going to go through. This is Commander John. Um, Commander John, this is his list. This is his list he keeps running. It's the list he built, it's the list he's got, and it's the list that he's, you know, he brought to his game with his local club, these are his local mates. He's got Typhus, we've got two Vilas Putrefires, Foul Blight Spawn, Lord of Virulence, two squads of Big Plague Marines, two squads of Cultists, two squads of Poxwalkers, two squads of Death Shroud, two Chaos Rhinos, two Blight Haulers, and three Plague Bus Crawlers, two with Anti-Tank, one with the Spitter. This is a pretty good sort of like casual list. It's got a bit of everything and it's quite nice. 90% of games here, John's going to be fine. Like, John's going to be able to play the game, have a good time, and at a casual level, this will, list will, will function and it will get work done. However, John's having a bit of a problem. Scenario H has happened. He's, this is John's local meta, it's his playgroup. Don't know what's happened here, but one day they all woke up and decided, Horde, that's for me. Um, for the Horde, that kind of thing, you know. 
Um, Andrew has decided to go Tyranid's Endless Swarm. Loves his bugs, tons of hormogons, absolutely tons. Colin has decided to wake up and decide, love me boys, you know, love me war. Um, so he's just gone green tide, tons of boys. And Miles has decided, I love the Emperor, I love getting people killed for no reason. I'm going to bring all the guardsmen in the world. What this has meant is now there's a scenario where there's tons of bodies. All these armies have the ability to resurrect units every time you kill them. So it's endless waves of guys. It keeps coming back. John keeps losing. He's not having fun anymore. He's miserable. God, please help me, Nurgle. So it's time for us to help John. <laughs> and John's going to help himself. And how's he going to do that? Well, he's going to help himself out by certain things that he's going to change in his list. So, John is going to tech. So, what he needs to like, figure out is he needs ways to start removing mass infantry more. He also needs to try and find a way to prevent the resurrection spam. Now, this is a, now don't worry, this is a very extreme scenario. Like, everyone in your playgroup just suddenly showed up with a horde army of regenerating models. It's not going to happen. We're using an extreme scenario here to show how teching can help you out. Um, so, we want to try and prevent resurrection spam. We also need to find a way to try and regain some board control. And to do this, we're going to bring in some new tech. So, this is a Noxious Blightbringer. People out there who know Death Guard and know the game are probably like, what are you on about, Aiden? This guy is not good. And this is what I want to talk about. Tech is tech. Doesn't matter what the internet tells you. Noxious Blightbringer will 90% of the time never be taken in competitive lists. But in this scenario that I've just presented... The Noxious Blightbringer is going to be your all-star because he is a tech unit at his core. So, what does he do? Reroll chance, charge and advances. That's cute. The real magic in this one is a combination we're going to use, which is while an enemy unit is within contagion range, each time a Battleshock or Leadership test is taken, subtract two from it. Okay, Aiden, where are we going with this? Well, John has three Plague Burst Crawlers. If you look on the right... We're going to look at the Spore Shockwave ability, which comes from a Plague Burst Crawler. After you hit a unit with the Mortar, they must take a Battle Shock test. Combine these two together, you're going to have these Horde units, which are usually leadership 11, 7 or 8, now be at minus 2 leadership and have to take a Battle Shock test every time they're hit by a Plague Burst Crawler. Why though, Aiden? Because Battle Shocked units can't use stratagems, which means... The annoying thing with these horde lists, every time you kill a unit, they spend two command points and resurrect the unit. You can't do that if you're battle shocked. So what we're going to do here is we're going to bring in this tech piece of a noxious blightbringer with this aura. We're going to hit a, a unit with the PBCs that were already in the list. We haven't brought them in crazily out of nowhere. They're in the list because they're just a good unit. The noxious blightbringer with them is going to now make the guardsmen, boys, gaunt test leadership at minus two and should they fail it which they have a good chance to fail it because of the minus two and this can get even worse you take the minus one leadership contagion that's going to be minus three to the leadership and as soon as they fail that leadership test you then use the rest of your army to wipe out that unit knowing it can't come back and bear in mind john's brought three plague burst crawlers so he could potentially do this to three units a turn and fully wipe them with a guarantee they aren't coming back this here is a 50 point, I think yeah, even less than that, it's like 45 or something, tech unit we're going to put into John's list that he's going to open up so much opportunity for him to stay in these games, okay? And this is exactly what a tech unit is. It is a unit that might not necessarily always be taken, but we're bringing it in to help shore up this problem that we're having in this local playgroup. The same can be said for all sorts of things. If your opponent has lots of tanks, maybe we bring in some Predator Annihilators so we have more last cannons. If, you know, if the opponent has lots and lots of, like, um, you know, really durable defensive stacking abilities, maybe we could start looking at a more tiring list because he's going to allow us to get around those. We're not trying to tailor completely. We haven't, we're not going to change John's list. In fact, let's have a look now. This is Commander John's new list. So what's he actually changed? Well, we've brought the Noxious Blightbringer. I gave it a little bit of an upgrade because we had some spare points. So it's going to have a bigger aura to make it more important. The only other real changes we've made are 
We dropped one of the Blight Haulers. We didn't drop both of them because that would be too tailory. But we dropped one of them because the anti-tank just isn't needed that much. And we brought in a Bloat Drone because that's going to allow us to fall back and shoot. The swarms of guardsmen are going to struggle to kill it. But it's going to be shooting every turn, charging every turn, which is really good. We've also consolidated our Death Shroud unit into one large unit because we want to make sure when we land that battle shock we have a unit that is going to be able to guaranteed kill a unit and six death shroud of a lord of virulence is definitely going to kill a unit now because we've lost two de our death shroud units we've combined them we've actually consolidated our pox walkers together because this is going to give typhus another squad to lead because before it was typhus and lord of virulence with a squad of death shroud each now there's only one squad of death shroud we consolidate the pox walkers we put typhus in it because now we've got a really hard unit that's going to struggle to be get chewed through by the guardsmen and stuff like that and it's going to be constantly regenerating models because typhus is killing with his mortal wounds with his scythe regenerating the zombies and that's going to help you retain board control so that hasn't even changed all we did is consolidate the units and we put typhus in the squad to make use of his rules to regain board control and another tech we've done is to look at the plague burst crawlers we've swapped out from two entropy cannons and one with spitters to two with spitters and one with entropy so we're not going a whole hog triple spitter because again that would be a bit maybe tailory but we've put a bit more anti-infantry weapons into this list so we have a bit more ability to clear out those tough uh, masses of infantry so what we've done is made a very couple tech changes not much has actually changed in this list but it's going to give this list a much better fighting chance without sacrificing too much in the other matchups you might get. Because again, you might have a, a non-horde player at your list. And this list would still work because we've still got some entropy cannons. We've still got a little bit of anti-tank from the Blight Hauler. And we're just going to make little changes like this to our list. That is exactly what teching is. It's not tailoring, it's teching. We don't want to rewrite the entire list because technically, if you wanted to tailor... Commander John could bring three spitter plague bus crawls, three spitter blow drones, 18 death shroud, a noxious blight bring a 10 plague rains, and he would never lose. He would kill absolutely everything. But again, it's not fun for our opponents. And he'd also have to go out and buy an entire new list. With what we've done here, we've had to go out and buy what? A noxious blight bringer and maybe a blow drone. Tops. Trying to keep it as minimal change as possible, maximum effect as possible. But that is the magic of soft bringing in these uh, new tech pieces to your list and the effect that they can have on the game. Okay, so last but not least, scoring units. So it's really important now we start looking at scoring in the game of Warhammer. Uh, points mean prizes, quite literally. That is the saying and it exists for a reason. So when we talk about scoring, um, victory points obviously win games. However, a lot of these can cost units and activations. So a lot of mission objectives will tell you to, instead of shooting, you do a certain action. Um, now, that's going to cost you a unit for a turn. Because let's say you have a really good 500 point knight castle and shooty mega death robot. That's really cool and all. Until you realise that you haven't brought any scoring units. And he stood in the only place that can be done to do a certain action to get you five victory points. So you're put in a scenario where either you score no victory points and you get none and then you lose the game. Or you score the victory points but now you've got a 500 point robot that can't do anything for the turn because he's busy doing this objective. So how do we get around this? Well, by bringing cheap, disposable scoring units or chaff sometimes referred to as. So instead of the 500 point knight having to do this, we can have a 50 point squad of guardsmen do it instead. And certain victory points are actually going to cost us entire units. Certain victory points are going to want you to basically like take an enemy's objective off them. But to do this, it's obviously going to put the unit that does it in a compromised position where they're probably going to die. So again, we, we want to try and do as minimal required effort to get the maximum reward. So... We could 100% send in our 6 Death Shroud in character, wipe out that unit on that point, 340 points terminates in character, then dies next turn. Not great. Or we could send 10 cultists in who can just stand on the point with 10 OC, flip it, 
we score the points and then they can die next turn and we've lost 50 points. So, as you can see, sometimes we need cheap units as well to just sort of go ahead and die for us, which is fine. Because again, minimal sacrifice for maximum reward. So it's important to bring units like this in your list. They're not exactly the most exciting, they're not exactly the most fun, but if you want a solid rounded list that's going to perform, it's very important to bring units for this. And bringing scoring units keeps games close, even in bad matchups, because you can keep scoring even if you're getting your head caved in a bit. And that's going to, when you're keeping the games close, it's going to keep you more focused and keep you more learning throughout the game, because a lot of times you're losing really bad by turn three or four, your brain starts to switch off. But if you spot enough scoring units, even though you're getting battered, you can keep the score close, which is going to make you keep wanting to play and keep learning to sort of even play from behind. And all it can take is one turn of bad dice rolls from your opponent or, you know, a spike, you really, like, you nail a 12-inch charge or something, and suddenly the game's back on. So bringing scoring units can also keep those games close uh, rather than being absolute runaways. So what makes a good scoring unit? Cheap, mobile, multi-purpose. Cheap being, obviously, we want to spend as little possible for these units. We don't want expensive units doing these actions. We don't want to be trading expensive units for free. Cheaper, cheerful. Mobile. The, the faster something can get around the board, the better it is. Because a lot of these objectives want us to be in certain places. So being fast is going to help us to get to certain places. It's great having a really cheap unit. If it moves two inches, it's really not going anywhere. It can, just, it can appear, maybe do something, and then it's stuck there forever. So the faster it is, sometimes the better it is. Multi-purpose is even better. Some units can achieve the art of being a scoring unit whilst also doing something else. This could be move blocking, like cultists. This could be providing a minus one to hit aura, like nerglings. Or it could be typhus, who quite often I'll run solo with no attached squad. He'll teleport in with deep strike, do one of these mission actions like homers or cleanse. And then because his only caveat is he can't shoot, he can still use his psychic attack because that's not a shooting attack. So he can drop in, do d6 malls to someone while scoring me five victory points. That's a win-win. <clears throat> uh, deep strike's another good rule for these units to have. You can just put a unit of Nurglings or you know a beast of Nurgle or again Typhus in deep strike. They can sit there um, and then you can basically just... You draw a card that says, oh, you must be in your enemy's deployment zone. <coughs> Apologies. You walk around to your opponent's table. You go, hey, have you left a gap anywhere? Oh, yeah, I left a gap over there. Cool. Typhus will drop in there. Or the Nurglings or something like that. And they will score me five victory points. Deep Strike allows you to make these kind of plays happen. It also means your opponent has to keep units back to try and stop things like this happening. Uh, which opens up your opponent to make mistakes, which is good. Another one is anything that has deployment tricks. Oh, and also don't forget strategic reserves as well. Strategic reserves do work. Not as good as Deep Strike, but still. 10, 10 cultists in reserves. It's not the worst thing you can do in the world to score points. Um, and anything that has deployment tricks. Um, a scout, scout move on our cultists. Infiltrate on stuff like Nurglings. Anything that can start outside of your deployment zone or move before the game is really good for secondaries because, again, you could get engaged in all fronts, turn one, which wants you to be in every quarter. Um, that's quite easy to get two because, you know, deploy, you could deploy them in two naturally. The problem is, Death Guard being slow, there's a good chance you can't get to that third quarter or the fourth quarter um, naturally. But we brought along a unit with Scout or a unit with Infiltrate like Nurglings and they have already moved ahead or deployed in that quarter anyway, which means if we do draw it turn one, we're at least going to get some points on it. And that's what these are the things that are going to make good scoring units. So, Nerglings are an amazing example. They are an ally, which again, there's nothing wrong with bringing allies, nothing wrong with not bringing allies. But Nerglings are great. Um, so, what Nerglings bring, I'm just going to have a quick sip for you, Barrett. Ah, apologies. Throats be dry. <laughs> so, Nurglings have infiltrators and deep strike. This means you can deploy Nurglings anywhere on the board that's not in nine inches of your opponent's deployment zone. This is great for that turn one board control, potentially, you know, getting investigated signals in a corner that you can't reach, engaging all fronts, all things like this. But if there's no good place for them to go, it also has deep strike, which means you can just keep them off the board. And then at any point, you can bring them in wherever they're needed to be. 
and then they can do something like cleanse if you hold the objective or deploy teleport homers, things like that. These guys also multi-purpose. They bring an aura of six inches, which is minus one to hit for infantry or beasts or, or mounted, anything that's not a monster or a vehicle within six inches. So now you can have a unit that can sit on a point, be cleansing while the tank next to it can keep shooting because the tank doesn't have to cleanse because the nerglings exist. And then they're also providing a defensive bonus because if someone decides to charge your tank or your, you know, your plague marines that are also on the point maybe, they're going to be minus one to hit. So these guys have a natural passive defensive aura whilst being able to score your points. And that's kind of what makes Nurglings so good at this role of a scoring unit. And it's kind of why we always want to bring a unit like Nurglings or Cultists or anything like that that is cheap, cheerful, multi-purpose, and scores us those all important victory points. Okay, so let's recap up and put this all together and sort of come to an end with this now. Um, so, this is my current list and that I'm running competitively. Uh, and I've split it up into the three topics we've talked about. I have my core, I have my tech, and my scoring. My core at my heart is the passive toolboxy playstyle, which is the triple play versus crawler because indirect is passive person's absolute dream. Um, I have 20 plague marines inside two rhinos because they're the bread and butter mechanized infantry. I have two by five and one by 10 so I can make different kind of plays. Maybe I just want to flip an objective, so I'll send out a five man. Maybe I want to really kill something, I'll send out the ten man. Um, toolbox playstyle, emphasized in the core. I also have bloat drones there to do stuff like trading and skirmishing, um, whilst also being utility for stuff like Overwatch with their flamers. Again, toolboxy playstyle. So I would describe my core here as a mechanized infantry toolbox. So tech choices. So what have I brought? I brought a lot of virulence for two reasons. One, I have free plague burst crawlers, so he has natural synergy with that, and it's going to help me build on my core by additionally giving them bonuses to hit and ignore cover, which is great, so it's benefiting my core. But why is he also a tech piece? Well, because he's going to go with six Death Shroud Terminators, which I have brought to deal with the current menace that is Custodes and Necrons, because one thing those factions hate is anti infantry flamers. One thing Death Shroud have is anti-infantry flamers en masse. And the Lord of Virulence is going to give them four rerolls to wound on those flamers. So he has come along to support the core, but also to be a tech piece with the Death Shroud to deal with a certain meta menace of the moment. I've also teched in two Malignant Playcasters because I really like how these play. They have really good melee shutdown, really good damage inside outside of a Rhino, and they can make they make toolbox plays so to be honest they could be an argument that these are core but really are they core no i could probably do without them at the same time but i'm really enjoying them and the utility they bring so i'm going to put them in the tech bit for now it's really good and the foul blight spawn again a tech choice i'm a passive player like to play passive having fight first on 10 plague marines can just give you an objective that can never be contested which is as a passive player is you know the dream come true it's exactly what i want so again, he goes on the list as a tech piece. And then to round it off, I have my scoring units. These are units here just to score stuff. Free Nurglings, again, we talked just then about how they can be multi-purpose. Usually gonna put them in deep strike, they teleport in, score me five victory points. Maybe they do something else, but even if they don't, don't really care. They can die 40 points for five victory points. Happy with that. Two squads of cultists, these again, these are going to get those early scoring, those early trades. But really, these guys are here to do scoring or action. So these guys can go in reserves, pop in, do an action. Or they can also be that turn one need to get into the middle of the board for something like teleport homers or storm hostile objective or cleanse. They're there for that. And then Typhus is also there. So Typhus is a bit of a tech piece because, again, Mortal Wounds is just good. But really, a lot of the time, I just use him to bring him in deal mortal wounds while scoring a secondary as well so really he actually ends up doing scoring more than anything but 80 points for a single base unit that can teleport in it's relatively hard to kill because he's still a terminator with two up four up invulnerable so he can't just get picked up like the nerglings and then if he does anything extra on top of scoring like melee or mortal wounds that's all a bonus on top of it so here 
We have my list broken down into core, tech pieces and scoring units. And all that comes together to make a solid list that works for my playstyle personally. So, to recap all this, understand yourself as a player. This, this episode isn't about buy X, do that, like I said. It's about trying to show you ways to identify yourself as a player and how to translate that into um, building a list that is right for you. Build a core you enjoy. The core is the heart of your list. Everything else can be you know, chopped and changed in and out of it, but building a core that you consistently do well with and have fun with is gonna be really important for you getting better as a player and enjoying the game. Then we tech around the core. So we look at you know who we play against, bring in some tech pieces for that. Maybe you just wanna try something new out. That's also fine to bring in a tech piece, You know, experiment with stuff. Um, and then obviously bring scoring units because scoring units are what's going to win you the game and winning the game and scoring points is going to be the thing that makes you a better player. A lot of people get caught up in just killing each other but sometimes killing everything just isn't going to go in your favour. It's a bad matchup. They have better stats. Maybe they're just a better Kili army but you bring the scoring and they don't, you're going to win 9 out of 10 of those games. And of course, the most important thing the golden rule. If you disagree with everything I've just said, 100% go for that. Do what you're finding fun. If you think, oh, this is, I don't want to think about list building. I just want to, I just want to bring models. I think cool. That's fine. That works for you, mate. You're having a blast of it. Best, best of luck. Have fun with that, man. That's all that matters is the golden rule when you're new to this hobby. But I hope for those that maybe want to like, you know, think a bit about, you know, where they want to take the list. Maybe you don't want to be worried about making bad purchases that by listening to this you've sort of understood how important it is to understand yourself as a player you've gone out you've played the thousand points games you're starting to get a feel and from there you can take this knowledge and apply it to the units you buy and add to your list okay so that's going to wrap this one up so thank you everyone for um, tuning in for listening and uh, thank you very much to Saltire Games who is our sponsor if you are after any Death Guard or Disgusting and Resilient themed gaming aids or tools to use in-game, check out their just link in the description below to their Etsy page. Use promo code NURGLE to get 10% off and give a bit of kickback to the channel. Uh, thank you also to Vanguard Tactics, who is our affiliate. Again, affiliate link below. If you want to really learn how to get good at the game at a rapid pace, we have all sorts of different courses that they, they, they offer that you can sign up for. Um, and those guys are amazing. They'll teach you all about sportsmanship, all about playing the game. Really good guys. I, I'm, I'm a member of them. I'm, I'm one of their coaches. So definitely check them out as well. Thank you to the members of the YouTube channel who financially support this. I really appreciate it. And we are trying to do our best to sort of keep content coming, keep fresh ideas coming. Um, not sure if you noticed maybe what I'm wearing. Could be a sp slight spoiler for things that could be coming. A little nerd in there. But we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, and obviously you, the viewer, thank you so much for tuning in. I massively appreciate you giving us a watch. I hope you found it useful. And yeah, there'll hopefully be some more to come. This is kind of wrapping up the core of Assembly to Annihilation. But if there's anything you think that could be covered in episode five, please do let me know. But if you have been here since episode one, you've built up to your first, you know, 2K army. I really hope you're enjoying yourself, having a fun time with the hobby and finding out what works for you. And just enjoying yourself because that's really what it's all about especially when you're new to the hobby so for now everyone take care stay rotten and i'll catch you all on the next episode see you later